This is the GI Yaris. And, well, frankly, there's not much I can say about it that you haven't already heard a thousand times before. For more than two years, auto journalists and YouTubers alike have raved on and on about this thing. Chris Harris said it was an instant icon, one of the best cars he's driven in years. Jeremy Clarkson said it was one of the most enjoyable and thrilling cars he's ever driven. Henry Catchpole, Harry Metcalf, Matt Watson, it doesn't really matter which review you watch. They'll all tell you that this little Yaris is something really special. But why? I mean, yes, it makes 270 horsepower through all four wheels and it has a wonderful six-speed manual gearbox. But we've had all of that before, right? The Focus RS, the Golf R, WRX STI, A45S, sort of, and tons more. And that's not even counting the price. I mean, at almost 60,000 New Zealand dollars, this thing is expensive. Barring some recent price hikes, you could buy a single motor Tesla Model 3 for that. So to choose this tiny, noisy, impractical, two-door, shift-it-yourself Japanese Super Mini over the literal future of the automobile, I guess you'd have to be insane to buy one of these. Anyway, this one's mine. I got the keys to this 2022 GR Yaris after putting a deposit down on one more than a year prior. These things are seriously hard to get down here in New Zealand. Since then, it's been our daily driver. Taking my wife and I to and from work every day, shooting out to the shops, all of that good stuff. But isn't this channel called JDM Classics, I hear you say? Why this? Why a brand new car? Well, the first part of that question is pretty easy to answer. As far as I'm concerned, this thing is already a JDM classic. Let's take a step back. Classic is a loaded word. It means it's different things to different people. To some, it conjures up images of 60s American muscle. To others, they might think of something pre-war with a hand crank and an operating manual only decipherable to someone with a master's in mechanical engineering. Many people think that classic only applies when a car is old, and that their sun-bleached Hyundai Elantra will somehow suddenly become desirable and collectible the minute it turns 20. I'm a child of the 90s. I grew up with the original Gran Turismo, the Need for Speed games, and uh, for better or for worse, Fast and Furious. Yes, the Diablo was drool-worthy, and the 456 and 550 Maranello made beautiful V12 music, but these weren't real. Ferraris, Lambos, Porsches... To me, these just seemed utterly unobtainable. Things to look at and admire from afar, but never to touch or experience, let alone own. But in the 90s, Japanese cars were different. They were better. They were real. I'll never forget my favorite car in the original Gran Turismo. A Mitsubishi GTO Twin Turbo. 3000 GT for any Americans watching. In my mind, it was every bit as beautiful and exotic as the Aston Martins or the Vipers or any other Western performance cars available, but at a fraction of the price. It represented technical achievement, value, performance, and everything else I would come to admire in Japanese cars of that era. Giving it a stage four turbo and dominating purpose-built race cars gave me my first taste for the excitement of modifying cars. But most of all, it had a Mitsubishi badge, like my dad's car. And the Supra had a Toyota badge, like my mum's car. And all of a sudden, I recognized everything driving around in the real world. As a small child, I could have pointed at a skyline and told you, that's a GDST, not a GDR. And I could have told you why that mattered. 
like I said, these cars, what I'd now consider to be JDM classics, they were real to me somehow. So let's fast forward a decade or so. The Japanese economic bubble has already burst long before this. But the impact of the automotive industry is finally being felt. Gone are the hatchback four-wheel drive turbo monsters like the Pulsar GTIR. Gone are the high-tech GTs like the Supra and the GTO. Gone are dozens of affordable front-wheel drive sports coupes like the FTO. The Japanese performance car scene is on life support, with cars like the Evo on death's door, the WRX making about the same power as it did 20 years ago, and the GTR being about as far removed from a real car as the Lamborghini Diablo was back in the day. Meanwhile, the Western car scene is firing some pretty serious shots. The super sports saloons like the M3, the C63 and the RS4 are getting more and more powerful with each generation. The Golf R has taken the crown of the crazy four-wheel drive hot hatch from the Japanese. And the new Mustang offers price to performance we haven't seen in years. Here's a fun exercise. Go back in time and find magazine shoots, videos of JDM car meets in the late 90s, then in the late 2000s, then in the late 2010s. Aside from some cool anomalies like the 8.6 and maybe the Z, you'll see pretty much the same lineup of cars each time. 90s JDM was just that good. And unfortunately, just that short-lived. You can probably see where I'm going with the GI Yaris. This car is the Japanese car industry as I remember it best. It's got a mundane badge, a kind of frumpy look. There's no real excess here, nothing too flashy or exotic. When sane, non-car people, see this thing, they say, oh, cool car, cool Yaris. Is it a hybrid? I love that. This car just flies in the face of the downturn of the JDM performance car industry and says, mm, no, not yet. You could take the modern body off of this thing give it something more contemporary and it would slot right in with the crazy stuff coming out of Toyota in the late 90s. Right alongside the Celica GT4s and the Altezza RS200s. Is it perfect? Hell no. From an objective perspective, it's not even that good. The ride is firm, back seats are a cruel joke. In New Zealand spec, it's missing simple modern features like parking sensors. The reverse camera is okay at best. The seating position is pretty high. Visibility is compromised front and back with the combo of screen and mirror blocking most of the front view with the rear view blocked by fat pillars and tiny windows. It doesn't love sitting in traffic and commuting in it I've noticed worse overall fuel economy than some much larger engine cars I've owned. Blah 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 you get the picture. Is it a bad daily? No. My 1979 Honda Civic with cracked piston rings, now that was a bad daily. This is a modern car. You'll struggle to find any modern car that's truly bad. But it is compromised. Let's get back to that Tesla. It's quieter than this, more comfortable, more high tech, it's faster. It's more practical, it's cheaper to run. It's better in basically every objective measure you would use to review a car for the average consumer. But then you drive the GI Yaris. And I mean, actually drive it. You find the perfect road, something nice and windy to really push it to the limit but with plenty of good straights to really wring its neck. The engine is warm, the tires are up to temperature. You move that torque dial to sport mode and send 70% of the power to the rear wheels and you drive. Everything is forgiven. All thoughts of objectively better leave your mind in an instant. 
I'll leave the technical explanation of why this thing is so good to the Chris Harrises of the world, i.e. people that can actually drive. All I know is from where I'm sitting, this thing is the perfect love letter to what JDM used to mean. It's Toyota showing us that underneath all of that boring beigeness, that company that made all the cool stuff in the 80s and 90s is still in there. In the face of economic crises, downturn, and the electrification of the industry, they haven't forgotten the good old days just yet. Is it one last ride? Maybe. <laughs> but it's one hell of a last ride if it is.